flesh and dwelt among us full of grace and truth. Now may your words so dwell within us that somehow our words would be yours. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Grace and peace to you this morning. Grace and peace. As far as parables in the Bible go, the one we have this morning is pretty much a sledgehammer. And while it is tempting to preach it as such, no one hears a word of grace while being hit over the head with a sledgehammer. Recently, some church members had received some literature from another church that used the language of this parable, standard fundamentalist fare, Several times they described the separation of man and God as a fixed and uncrossable chasm. The language comes straight from the parable, and the only way to cross this chasm is Jesus. Reading that and having grown up in the South, I want to add several syllables to the name. The only way to cross the chasm is Jesus. Relax, that's the only time I'm doing that. (laughs) I nearly had people leave the 8.30 service after that one. (laughs) Strangely, in that pamphlet, nowhere did it mention anything from this parable about a gated community with a rich man inside feasting sumptuously and a poor sick man at the gate. Progressive Christians often view this parable the opposite way, and they cheer the righteous punishment of the callous wealthy one without necessarily caring about the covenant to which the parable points and certainly with discomfort about language regarding heaven and hell. So what do we do with this story? Do we leave this parable divided between fundamentalists and progressives, kind of like South America was divided between Spain and Portugal years ago? Or is there a word here for both? Is there somehow a word of life and beauty in this story? Dr. Frank Thomas has talked about the chasm we find in here. The church has often read this and demonized the rich and sanctified the poor. But is there a word in here for both rich and poor? Our modern politics do the same thing, depending on which side of the aisle we are on. Either the Koch brothers or George Soros, both sides with their vast riches and their funding of their political preferences, surely the root of all evil in the world. Similarly, either the desperate coal miners of Kentucky or the desperate inner city youth are the sources of real, true American pride and possibility. But is there a word here for our political divides? Is there a word here for both those who live in gated communities and those whose livelihoods are vulnerable and at risk? Or to ask it another way, if this story isn't good news here, can it be good news anywhere? One thing is, it is a parable. It is not told as history or as fact or as prophecy. And things in this parable are are exaggerated. They're exaggerated. The rich man isn't just rich. He wears purple and fine linen, the cloth of royalty. He doesn't just eat lunch. He feasts, and he feasts sumptuously. The poor man is not simply poor. He is poor and he is sick. He is covered in sores. He not only begs at the gate, but he has no strength to fend off the dogs. Maybe in our our sanctified imaginations, we can see that everyone in town would know the rich man's name. 
He's one of those who can get a loan from the bank by walking in and simply signing the paper. We can be pretty sure all the local elected officials know who he is too, and they make room on their calendars for him. And probably all the local arts programs know exactly who he is and who to send to go ask that he be one of the angel level benefactors for whatever the program might be. We can also be pretty sure that no one in that man's household would know the name of the poor man at the gate. The sick, dying man would be a punchline to a joke, a cautionary tale to the children, a boogeyman used as an example in political arguments. Here's one of the difficulties I have with this parable is I don't know anyone who always dresses in bespoke designer suits. That's the equivalent of wearing purple and fine linen for today. I don't know anyone who feasts sumptuously at every meal. But I also don't know anyone who is as poor as the man at the gates. But I do know this. There are no caricatures in the eyes of God. There are no punchlines to jokes in the eyes of God. There are people. And these people are children of God, created in the image and likeness of God. And everyone who has worked at the Island Heart Food Pantry knows something that our story tells us today. Because what it tells us is, the poor have a name. They are people. They are children of God. And the covenant of God from the days of Moses through the days of the prophets to the days of Jesus says the same thing. Care for the poor, care for the widow, care for the orphan, not care about them. Care for them. And that hasn't changed. That covenant hasn't changed from Moses to the prophets to even someone who might say this having been risen from the dead. Even Jesus the Christ. In the covenant of God, every single person is known by God by name. Loved by God, by name. Every single person. Thanks be to God. Amen.